Hello everyone, my name is Charles and welcome back to the channel. Now in this video we'll be going over the psychological effects of capitalism on the people who live under this system. Now this time I'm going to make the video a little bit different, I'm not going to talk to the camera the whole time. I'm going to add a bit of visual support. I hope you guys enjoy the new uh, video style. So just sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Ever since the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s, cases of mental health issues have kept steadily rising as we reach an era of late-stage capitalism. From the anxiety of the current economic system, to depression, burnouts, and constant competition, capitalism has had huge impacts on the well-being of individuals. Let's look at the effects of individualism, the system's anxiety, and overworking on the mental health conditions of the people. In this world of neoliberal, chronic capitalism that incentivizes people to work in such ways that seem to be against their nature. First and foremost, the development of a capitalist society has seen mental illness to be classified as one of the biggest reasons for distress and misery across individuals. According to the Hampton Institute, one in four people in the UK today have been diagnosed with a mental illness, and four million people take antidepressants every year. Evidence heavily correlated this epidemic of mental illness with social and economic determinants of capitalism and wealth inequality. Let's then observe the alienation of workers from their labor. Many people feel alienated from their work, dissociated from it, with the feeling that they don't actually contribute to the improvement, the development of society. The consistent increase in specialization and the separation of labor has caused nearly 87% of global workers to not feel engaged with the work they do. Study after study shows that more pay does not mean a happier life. However, your engagement, and if you are helping the community, that makes a truly happy working experience. Capitalism rewards crazed behaviors. 21% of 261 corporate professionals had clinically significant psychopathic traits. This is what capitalism is in our words. As a species, we are better than this allowing people to do the labor of which they feel engaged with, regardless of the economic fears, will create a more productive and happier society. Evidently, higher wages do not usually mean higher fulfillment and satisfaction. The field, the interest of the worker, and the engagement do. Capitalism rewards individuals for entering fields they loathe simply because the wages are more attractive. Furthermore, people working in factories are completely alienated from the product they're making, only creating part of a final object that will end up consumed by an individual who regards the work behind it with philistinism. Capitalism inserts itself in the existence of people. We start selling our labor power like commodities, becoming one ourselves, from our early teens until we retire at an age where life is not as enjoyable. Then, hustle culture pushed by capitalists wrecks individuals, making them think that constantly overworking themselves for the financial benefit of a capitalist is a good thing. We think we're doing just fine. Capitalism exploits the inner sadomasochist that dwells in us. It is self-evident that capitalism destroys the mental well-being of its victims. Others feel the disparities in wealth, inequality, and social isolation caused by this crony system. Capitalism being based on competition between individuals incentivizes people to measure themselves against others, falling victims to greed and the constant need for more. Philosopher and economist Karl Marx proposed that this feeling is not natural. It comes from the economic and social system, which is capitalism. Under an egalitarian system, people do not feel this constant anxiety caused by the market forces. When a person works for their own self-centered interests, to receive what little wage the capitalist agrees to pay them, they are not as fulfilled as if they work, let's say, for their community in exchange for its other members' goods and services. The system itself makes it so individuals of the working class see their peers as threats or enemies, rather than comrades, people they can work with. We constantly compare ourselves to the rich and powerful, even though the rate of upwards mobility has kept steadily declining since 1985. Our mere existence is measured by economic success rather than the abilities, the skills we possess. Furthermore, it is important to note that capitalism is a system built upon a contradiction. To be specific, it is a contradiction of classes, caught in irreconcilable antagonisms that the social democrat state claims to alleviate, the producers, or proletariat, who allow society to function and produce, the value of which we consume, have no actual say over the production, caught in a system where democracy is not even extended to the workplace. The system is built upon a distrust of the worker and the idea that they and their labor can be bought and sold as any other commodity. We're fundamentally better than that. Our labor power is an embodiment of our ability, our capacity to create and shape our own needs. This is what separates us from any other animal, thus our ability to produce should be celebrated. 
not alienated. The increased specialization, overproduction, and automation under capitalism do not only create economic issues, but they destroy humanity itself. Our ability to produce should not be exploited simply in favor of a profit. Following through with this idea, it's quite easy to realize how these feelings breed inequality, which in turn causes massive impacts on the mental well-being of the members of society. As the Royal College of Psychologists reports, inequality is a major determinant of mental illness. The greater the level of inequality, the worse the health outcomes. Children from the poorest households have a threefold greater risk of mental ill health than children from the richest households. Mental illness is consistently associated with deprivation, low income, unemployment, poor education, poor physical health, and increased health risk behavior. The reality of the individual is based on the reality of his community. A member of a poorer community will most likely end up the same way. This system makes us live wrongly, with bad incentives, rewarding unhealthy behavior that goes against our social nature. It is thus clear that the socio-economic system we live under, being capitalism, is responsible for the surge in mental illness we observe today. When the basic needs of people are not met because of the not-so-free markets, mental health is sure to become an issue. Paul Baran and Paul Sweezy pointed out that the consequences of capitalism have huge effects on mental health. The system fails to provide the foundations of a society capable of promoting the healthy and happy development of its members. Then, let's observe commodity fetishism and consumerism. Humans naturally use nature to create products that help them accomplish certain tasks. We attribute a use value to these items depending on their usefulness. However, with capitalism comes a different mentality. We work simply to acquire products. Eventually becoming dissatisfied with them and getting the newer model. We are alienated from the commodity and fetishize it because of this contradictory system that works to the great society. By the way, this idea of commodity fetishism and is intertwined with Sigmund Freud's sexual fetishism theory, so it's definitely worth a read. Finally, the psychopathology of capitalism works not only to destroy the individual, but also presents itself as a great system that incentivizes a push for growth and innovation. Famous political theorist Mark Fisher noted that it is not an an exaggeration that being a teenager in a late-stage capitalist world is not close to being reclassified as a sickness. So by privatizing mental health issues, any question of systemic causation of these problems is ruled out. Capitalism has huge impacts that are not even attributed to it, making any change in the system that much harder. We live under conditions that neglect mental health and give us less time than necessary to plan ahead, establish routines, or even surf between the worlds that were established for working class people. Mental health always has been and will continue to be an issue until the system is overthrown. Not all of these elements are bad, but what's even worse is the mindset we have towards this situation. Let's now talk about the concept of capitalist realism. Fisher makes the argument that the war on terror has prepared us for an authoritarian development where the normalization of crisis brings about a situation where repealing measures brought in to deal with emergencies become unimaginable. The following paragraphs were written by TikToker Neo Gerald when condensing the whole book into a small essay. I then uh, expanded on it a bit. The idea of a capitalist realism is the widespread notion and sense that capitalism is the only viable economic system, and that imagining an alternative to it is now impossible. It presents itself as a shield protecting us from danger. This functions to lower our standards because the current state of affairs is totally just a small price to pay to avoid terror and totalitarianism, as we disregard the development of authoritarianism in our society. So Fisher points out that we live in an unequal society in which our existence is evaluated solely by money, by our ability to succeed financially. That's completely against our human nature, yet it's painted as an ideal. To justify this, conservatives and liberals don't paint the system as an ideal magnificent one. Rather, they paint any alternative to it as evil and terrible. To quote the book, sure, they say, we may not live in a condition of perfect goodness, but we're lucky that we don't live in a condition of evil. Our democracy is not perfect, but it's better than those bloody dictatorships. Capitalism is unjust, but it's not criminal like Stalin. Sure, we might let millions of African kids die of AIDS, but we don't make racist nationalistic relations like here Milosevic. We kill Iraqis with our airplanes, but we don't cut their throats with machetes like they do in Rwanda. In short, it is a sad reality, but there is widespread notion that the system we live under today, a system of authoritarian capitalism, is the only viable one, and everything else is an evil, bloody dictatorship. Fisher then expands on capitalist realism. He describes it as a pervasive atmosphere that acts as an invisible barrier restricting thought and action. Fisher asks, if capitalist realism is so prevalent, 
And if current forms of resistance are so hopeless, where can effective challenges come from? A moral critique of capitalism that argues it always leads to suffering only reinforces capitalist realism. Poverty, famine, war, inequality, hierarchies, exploitation and all its other issues can then be presented as an inevitable part of reality. Any hope to end this is painted as naive or utopian. Psychoanalysis's idea of the reality principle invites us to be suspicious of any reality that presents itself as natural. Fisher argues, the reality is itself brought about ideologically. It is the highest form of ideology precisely because it presents itself as the empirical fact or necessity. For Lakin, the real is what any reality must suppress. The real is an unpresentable X, a thing that can be only seen through inconsistencies in our apparent reality. The real is that which is real or true. Reality is what presents itself as real. Fisher uses environmental catastrophe as an example of real. Although climate change and the threat of resource depletion are not being repressed, they are incorporated into advertising and marketing. Capitalist reality lies on the street of environmental catastrophe, the idea that resources are infinite and that any problem can be fixed by the market. The relationship between capitalism and environmental disaster is neither coincidental nor accidental, due to capital's constant need to expand in its markets and its growth fetish. Capitalism is by its very nature opposed to any notion of sustainability, yet firms advertise by using this nature. Now let's then look at the behavior of different groups facing this neoliberal dystopia. Compared to people in the 1960s and 1970s, British students appear to be politically disengaged. While French students can be seen protesting against neoliberalism, British students seem to have accepted their fate. This is not out of apathy or cynicism, but rather reflective impotence. They know the system works against them, but they also know that they can't do anything about it. Depression is endemic. It is the condition most dealt with by the NHS, and it's afflicting more and more people at increasingly younger ages. Fisher says it is not an exaggeration that being a teenager in late-stage capitalism in Britain is now close to being reclassified as a sickness. By privatizing these issues, treating them like they are caused by factors that they have nothing to do with their actual causations, any question of systemic causation of these problems is ruled out. The problem is capitalism, yet we don't acknowledge it, for the system is seen as the only viable ideology. And these selfish capitalists, Oliver James points to the significant rises in the rates of mental distress over the last 25 years. For example, 16% of 36-year-old women in 1982 reporting having trouble with nerves, feeling low, depressed, or sad. Whereas 29% of 30-year-olds reported this in 2000. For men, it was from 8% to 13%. He argues that selfish capitalism only contributes to this entrepreneurial fantasy society in which anyone can be Bill Gates or Aladdin Sugar. Despite the fact that, uh, as I said earlier, upward mobility has thoroughly decreased. The thing most poisonous about shellfish capitalism and harmful to well-being, Fisher argues, is the systematic encouragement that material affluence or wealth is the key to fulfillment, that only the rich and affluent are winners, and that anyone has access to and can make it to the top as long as they are willing to work hard enough. You are to blame if you do not succeed. So the ruling class ontology, which is the concepts and ideas, denies any possibility of a social causation of mental illness. The chemical biologization of mental illness is in proportion to its depolitization. Considering mental illness as an individual issue with someone's brain chemistry has enormous benefits for capitalism, the first one being it reinforces capitalism drive toward individualization, uh, which is you are sick because of your brain chemistry, not because of the system. Secondly, it provides a profitable market for multinational firms pharmaceutical companies to sell you placebo pills that don't actually affect you. If it is true that depression is caused by low serotonin levels, what still needs to be explained is why particular individuals have low serotonin. This requires a social and political explanation. If the left wants to challenge capitalist realism, we must repoliticize mental illness. Pharmaceutical companies love to provide a fix for the issue in pointing out one of the symptoms but never the root cause of the problem. In example, you have low serotonin and that's it. They don't actually explain what causes it, despite that cause being the system, capitalism. Fisher hypothesizes that what synthesized neoliberalism and neocon was their shared object abomination, the nanny state and the people who depend on it. Despite pushing an anti-statist rhetoric, neoliberalism in practice is not necessarily opposed to the state, as the bank bailouts in 2008 showed, but rather the two 
particular use of state funds. Meanwhile, the neoconservatism strong state was confined to military and police functions and defined itself as against a welfare state. The concept of the nanny state continues to haunt capitalist realism. Fisher argues that governments are often blamed precisely for its failure to act as a centralizing power to or authority. To quote, conservative and labor governments have discovered that when they give powers to private companies and those private companies screw up, voters blame the government for giving the powers away rather than the companies misusing them. Fisher argues that the effects of late-stage capitalism are fear and cynicism. They believe that people are motivated entirely by self-interest. He says this breeds conformity and stunts entrepreneurial leaps. There is minimal variation as companies simply turn out products that closely resemble what has already been successful, which is so much for innovation. Despite initial hopes, the 2008 financial crisis did not undermine capitalism. Speculations that capitalism was on the verge of collapse proved to be wrong. Fisher argues that the exact opposite occurred. The bank bailouts were a reassertion of the capitalist realist idea that there is no alternative. Allowing the banking system to fail was deemed unthinkable, and what occurred after was the vast accumulation of public money into private hands. However, 2008 did show the collapse of the framework that provided ideological cover for capitalist accumulations in the, since the 1970s, but neoliberalism assumptions still continue to dominate the political economy. Fisher says the crisis led to the relaxing of a certain kind of mental paralysis, a space has been created for a new anti-capitalism to emerge that is not necessarily tied to old language or traditions. To quote Fisher, the failure of previous forms of anti-capitalist political organization should not be a cause for despair, but what needs to be left behind is a certain romantic attachment to the politics of failure. Nothing is inherently political. Politization requires political agents to transform what is accepted and taken for granted into something that is up for grabs. Neoliberalism triumphed by taking on the desires of post-68 working class, a new left or anti-capitalist movement could begin by building on desires neoliberalism has created but has been unable to satisfy, i.e. free healthcare, free housing, cheap or free education. Now Fisher suggests that we should argue what neoliberalism failed to do, which is a massive reduction of bureaucracy, worker ownership and autonomy, which is democracy in the workplace. It is clear that we live in a dystopia, and escaping capital uh, will prove to be a very hard challenge, and I really hope we'll one day get there. On that note, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you all later.